Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever.
be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jebedoam with a sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus, Amos said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword. Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos said, answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. King Herod heard of Jesus and his disciples, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. For this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men to arrest John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been, had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. But Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing he was a, right, a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his, when his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, 
the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with others to bring John's head. He went and beheaded John in prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. this lesson. It's only when they change the lectionary cycle that they put this in. And why? Like, why do we need to hear this? I kept asking myself that all week. Why do we need to hear that? Why did Mark decide this was important to put in the gospel at all? As a matter of fact, if you're interested, you look at John 6, verse 13, and then skip to verse 30, it reads fluidly. Like, it literally looks like Mark went cut, put in this story about John being beheaded. Why? Is it because he sort of drops this bomb? I think it's in chapter 1 when he says, and then John was arrested, and he feels the need to go back and, like, maybe I should unpack why that happened and what that's all about. I was talking to Julia Howard about this this week when I was preparing for this homily, and she, being sort of a writer herself, said, Maybe it was a word count issue. And he just felt like I had to get so many words in. Maybe. Um, a lot of scholarship says maybe it's foreshadowing for what's going to happen to Jesus. Well, if that's true, then Jesus' disciples did a terrible job. I mean, look at what John's disciples did. They came, they get the body, they give him a proper burial. What did Jesus' disciples do? Run off in the night. So I kept asking myself, what? Why do we need to hear this? Why do we need to know what happened? What, what can we learn from this? If you're interested in the political reasons why maybe this is in there, like what was happening with Herod and his brother and marrying the wife and the other rulers and what's going on in Rome and all of that, if you're interested in the politics, please see Carter. He's way nerded out on this. He's got a map and everything. Currently, he's with Jan streaming the service, but you can find him after, and he would love to talk to you about all the politics of what's going on in the story. But I think for us today, I'd like for us to look at the story and think about the two main characters, Herod and John, and what their choices teach us. So let's look at John for a minute. I love John the Baptist. I think this is John the Baptist in this picture. And this is the only church I've ever served, or I think ever even been in, that has a half-dressed John the Baptist window. Um, but I love him. He's so eccentric and so brave. He's, 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 in my opinion, this huge giant for us in our family tree. He's kind of like St. Francis in a way, and Jason is known to say that, you know, all of us really love and admire St. Francis, but we're never really going to live like him. Like, we all love that he lives this way, but none of us are going to be brave enough to do that. I kind of feel that way about John, too. Um, he's so committed to his call. He's so clear on, this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm, I'm out here to preach repentance and forgiveness. That's what I'm here, to, and to baptize people, and to call them forth to live this way of life. And he does it like in electric colors, right? In three-dimensional. He, he doesn't stop. He's so courageous. He's so clear. And he doesn't matter if he offends people. He's not really concerned about that. He's not worried about what people think about him. He just knows this is so important. I love people too much. I trust what God has called me to do too much, not to call them over and over again, repent Live differently. Be baptized. Live a full, whole life, right? And it, and it gets him in trouble. He ends up in, uh, he doesn't, he'll, he'll say even to, to people in power, you're not living correctly. And he ends up in jail. 
But even from jail, he's preaching. It doesn't stop him. Nothing stops him. And even though it leads eventually to his death, and he's beheaded, he's still not silenced, is he? Because here we are today, all these years later, thinking about him and thinking about his word. And all of us have been baptized. And regularly, when we baptize people, we renew our baptismal vows. And even every Sunday when we come and show up here together, in some way or another, consciously or unconsciously, we are renewing them, promising to respect the dignity of every human being even those that are not like us, living by word and example, the good news of God in Christ, and all the other vows that we have. We claim those again and again. And maybe even just for a moment, we feel as energized, as empowered, as brave as John. And we can show up in the world and speak truth to power, whatever that power is. Now, I have not in my lifetime been called to go to a, a political leader to show up in Washington. I've not been called like Martin Luther King to go and speak publicly in that way. I don't know, maybe some of you have. But all of us in our daily lives can speak truth to power, whatever the power is. Maybe it's a relationship in our family. And we have been avoiding speaking truth because it may lead us to an uncomfortable situation. Maybe we have not been brave enough to say to a close friend, you know, when you speak that way, it, it encourages racism. When, or we say to, to someone in our family, you know, when you make this choice, it's one more step to hurting the planet. Or whatever the issue is. Or when you do that, it makes me feel unheard. Or maybe we do it to ourselves. Maybe we do so much self-hate talk that we don't even speak truth to that mean one within us holding us back. But John says to us, no, speak truth to power. Speak love. Speak forgiveness. So what about Herod? So you've got John speaking freely. Even when he's beheaded, his voice is still heard. And so what of Herod? Well, he's the powerful one, right? He's not really a king, and Carter can explain all that to you later, but he calls himself king. And so he's got all this power for sure, and he's called this big party, and I just want to say, this is a weird party, right? I mean, all these powerful people, I make up, everybody's pretty drunk for them to decide it's, it's a great idea to have this girl come and dance for them. And there's a whole other class we can take on the evilness in Herodias that she would encourage her daughter to go do this. But anyway, the girl goes and dances and pleases everybody to the point where Herod then is willing to give away half of what he has. And so, as you heard, the girl asks for John's head. And the funny thing about Herod is that Mark makes sure that we know that he likes John that he's heard John's message. He's perplexed by him, but he gets like, but this is a holy man. This is a righteous man. And he, I, I kind of see, picture him as like, you just can't not listen to him. I don't really understand him, but I can't not listen to him. There's something in Herod that is drawn to him. And so he's given an opportunity to, ch to make a choice. Can he choose to speak his truth? Or does he just keep the party going? And he keeps the party going. He's too afraid. He's, he's trapped in his own ego, in his own love for his status. He's enslaved in how the world sees him and how others see him. And so he presses down what he knows to be true, and he keeps the party going. Do we do that sometimes? And what happens to Herod in the end? We don't know exactly in, this, in the gospel today, but we don't have stained glass windows of Herod, right? And we don't talk about what he, you know, the, the 
powerful things he does. He doesn't get beheaded, and yet he's the one whose voice is silenced. And he does it himself. John may have been in prison, but John was certainly free. Herod may be powerful and in charge, but he is definitely enslaved. Great witnesses for us today, aren't they? Great reminders that we have a choice in our life, in our daily interactions with people, with issues. Will we speak the truth as we've been given, or will we keep the party going? Are we willing to let it be messy, or have we rather be comfortable? I think about that for us as a church, too. As we begin to move forward now, since the pandemic is, is shifting and ending, and we're able to gather back together, and we can think about, as we move into the fall, kind of what are we going to do programmatically? How are we going to do, what are we going to do with outreach? What are we going to do about how we worship together? What are we going to do with the compassion ministries we have? How are those going to be examples of us speaking truth? Or are they going to be just ways that we stay comfortable? I think that's the real opportunity for the church right now. I don't think people are interested in finding places to feel safe and, um, and sort of bored. I think people are hungry and they want community and they want to know the truth, that they are loved, that they are valued by God, that nothing will keep them enslaved, that, God loved, that God's love frees them always, ultimately. So what will we choose? Freedom or enslavement? Let us affirm our faith by saying together, We believe in God above us, maker and sustainer of all life, of sun and moon, of water and earth, of male and female. We believe in God beside us, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, born of a woman, servant of the Lord, tortured and nailed to a tree, a man of sorrows. Remembered today, those who have made the news headlines today because of what they have done or said. Those who have been brought to our attention through a meeting or conversation. Those who are in the hospital, in care, or in a place which is strange to them. those in whose family, marriage, or close relationship there is stress or a breakup. Those who are waiting for a birth or a death 
or news which will affect their lives. Those who need to forget the, the God they do not believe in and meet the God who believes in them. Those whose pain or potential should not forget to be shared with God today. Lord, we believe that you hear our prayer and will be faithful to our prayer to your promise to answer us. When our eyes open again, may they do so not to end our devotions, but to expect your kingdom. For Jesus' sake, amen. On this day, we give special thanks for the blessings God has bestowed upon us, and in particular for the birthdays of Edward McCarran, Bob Rizzo, Jordan Taylor, and Sidney Taylor, and for the wedding anniversary of Vince and Margot Brown. And we remember those who have died, today remembering especially our beloved sister Luann Holland. Peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. God's grace be with all on this overcast day, and I apologize that we're inside since it's not actually actively raining right now. Um, the weather forecast was unpredictable, and it's very damp outside, so my apologies that we're inside since I know so many of us love to be in the cloister in the summer months. Uh, just a couple of very quick notices. Um, the first is a reminder for the dads of children still at home, say, that we have a gathering of the dads in the trenches this Wednesday night at the home of Steve Pope. Uh, if you have not responded yet to the RSVP, or the, I'm sorry, the invitation, uh, there's information in the bulletin. You can let us know in the office. Uh, it's, uh, again, this Wednesday night, 6.30. And for the dads who've perhaps never been to this gathering, it, this would be a wonderful time to start uh, on the 14th. Uh, the, um, I think, all other announcements, I'm simply going to ask you to, to read on your own. Uh, I did want to mention, though, that Becca Daly, the wonderful alto who was supposed to sing this morning, is sick. So she will not be singing today, but she's going to be singing the same piece in a couple of weeks. Um, so actually, I shouldn't tell you when she's going to sing. Just say she's going to sing in the future, and that way you have to come back every week uh, to hear uh, Becca and her gorgeous, rich voice. So I'm sorry. She came up under the weather this morning. But again, please read all other, the other announcements, especially the one perhaps about the triathlon on August 28th. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. did have one more announcement. I'm sorry. 
at communion time, Heath and I will position ourselves at the corners of the front here. And if you would simply please come out the side aisles, receive communion, and go back down the center, making sure again to keep social distancing, especially from the younger people among us who uh, have not yet been vaccinated. So please come out the side aisles for communion at the corners and then back up the middle. Thank you. Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Christ give God thanks and praise. Honor and worship are indeed your due, our Lord and our God, through Jesus Christ. For you created all things. By your will they were created, and for your glory they have their being. In your loving purpose, you chose us before the foundations of the world to be your people. You gave your promises to Abraham and Sarah and bestowed your favor on the Virgin Mary. In your Son, you suffered with us and for us, offering us the healing riches of salvation and calling us to freedom and holiness. Therefore, with people of every nation, tribe, and language, with the whole church on earth and in heaven, joyfully we give you thanks and sing. <laughs> perfect offering for the brokenness of the world, that all who believe in him might have eternal life. The night before he died, our Lord Jesus gathered with his friends and took bread. And when he had given you thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. And when he had given you thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, in this sacrament of the suffering and death of your Son, we now celebrate the wonder of your grace as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ, Christ is dying. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine which we receive may be to us the body and blood of Christ, and that we, filled with the Spirit's grace and power, may be renewed for the service of your kingdom. Redeemer God, rich in mercy, infinite in goodness, we were far off 
until you brought us near, and our hands are empty until you fill them. As we eat this bread and drink this wine, through the power of your Holy Spirit, feed us with your heavenly food, renew us in your service, unite us in Christ, and bring us to your everlasting glory. Lasting honor and glory be yours, here and everywhere, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Hallelujah. And now let us pray the prayer of spiritual communion for those worshiping with us virtually. My loving Lord, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I cherish you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot receive you in the sacrament of your body and blood, come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen you in your great grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you and you in me, in this life and in the life to come. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God.
loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us to our and nourishing us with the spiritual food in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth the people for him, heal, renew, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the rhythm of life of Christ our Savior. Amen. Go into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Amen.